So welcome to College Algebra. <clears throat> so how was the other instructor? Was okay? It was good. Good. Different. Yeah. Well, unavoidably. He did a lot of writing. Yeah. Did he? Extra years. I see. Well, at least he showed. Did he show all of his work? Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Um, are you going to be posting the written homework uh, piece? Yes, I'll post them this afternoon. Okay. Yeah, I got I got delayed. Uh, part of the re and those delays include why I was absent on Wednesday. But anyhow, personal business. Um, <clears throat> other questions? Okay, so let's go over something that you did on Wednesday. So uh, here's a question. Find the equation of the line through through uh, point three nine which is uh, so in the first case parallel to 2x plus 4y is 5, and in the second case, perpendicular to 2x plus 4y is 5. Okay, so what do you think? What kind of things do you need? How many things do you need to find the equation of a line? You need two things. What two things? A slope and a y-intercept would do. So you're, you're pretty much always going to need a slope. Okay, uh, y-intercept you can do what what if what if that's a particular point right that happens to be on a yeah so a y intercept happens to be on the y axis but what if i give you a point that is not on the y axis for example have i given you a point that's on the y axis mm -hmm. i gave you 3 9 is is that on the y axis no. it is not okay so generally speaking you need two things a point and a slope okay so when you're looking for the equation of a line, it's always two things. Somehow you'll be given a point and a point from which you can obtain a slope and then use either point. Or I give you a slope and a point. Or I give you a point, uh, a slope and an intercept. Somehow, always two things. So half of this question is, e is pretty easy. Why? Because, because I explicitly gave you the point, right? Th which point? This point. Okay. So the point that the line goes through is x1, y1 is 3, 9. To find the slope, it's a little bit more involved, slightly. So how are we going to find the slope? Okay. What, what do you mean? Okay, so rearrange this equation. Yes. Okay, so it's so that it's in the form y is mx plus b. Okay, so I'll do that on on good faith. So two x plus four y. Uh, so then, oops. So then four y is negative two x plus five, and then if I divide by four, what's the new right hand side? Um, y equals negative one. Okay, good. Okay, so I did as instructed. So now what? Celebrate. <laughs> okay. So how, how does this assist us toward our goal? 
Well, it gives us the slope of this other line, but that's not the line that we wanted. And, and it also gives us the y-intercept of this line, but that's not the line we were requested to find. We were requested to find some other line. But the slope is the same because it's parallel. Ah, there you have it. So parallel lines, what must be, so when you look at them visually, they don't intersect. Or they intersect at every point because a line is parallel to itself. So parallel lines intersect either zero times or infinitely many times. Algebraically, that means that they must have the same slope. Okay, so that is to say that this is the slope of the line that was given, and as a result, the slope of the line that we want is the same slope, m is negative half. Any question about that? Okay, so I open the question by asking, by asking, um, how many things do you need? You need a point and a slope. Okay, so we did that. But then I, I didn't go into any detail about just what we were going to do when we, when we did that. <laughs> so what do we do now that we have a point and a slope? Point slope yeah, now we use the point slope formula. So the point slope formula is y minus y1 is m x minus x1. And now it's just a matter of plugging things in. So what is y1? 9. Uh, and then m is negative half. And then what's x1? 3. And so now, if this was a graded exercise, I would say, and I want you to give your answer in slope-intercept form. What is slope-intercept form? Y is mx plus b. So y minus 9 is negative half x plus 3 halves. So now what do we need to do? Add 9. Add nine. So if we add 9 to both sides, I can see I'm going to have to add it to 3 halves. Well, how many halves is 9? 18 of them, right? 9 is 18 halves, and then 3 more is 21 halves. <clears throat> okay, so that's the answer to part 1. This is 18 halves, okay. and then three more is 21 halves. Okay, so now find a line which is perpendicular, which is passing through the given point 3, 9, and perpendicular to, to uh, the same line. So, um, hmm. what does the word perpendicular mean, by the way, visually? Intersecting at a right, right. In intersecting at a right angle. Uh, so parallel, lines which are parallel, the algebraic condition is that their slopes must be the same. Slopes must be the same. What is the algebraic condition for perpendicular lines? They must be negative reciprocals of each other, which is to say that their products must be negative 1. The product of the slopes must be negative 1. Okay, so the point, that's easy. A point which is on this line that we're looking for is x1, y1 equal to 3, 9. And then the slope, the slope of the line the, that we were given is negative half. Okay, so then the slope of the line that we want is the negative reciprocal of this. So the slope of the line that we want is negative and then reciprocate that. So simplified, what is that? Two. Any question about getting the slope of the perpendicular line? So now what?
points low. So y minus y1 is m x minus x1. That's the formula that you need to memorize. Uh, so then this will be y minus 9 is 2 times x minus 3. So then y minus 9 is 2x minus 6. So then y is 2x plus 3. Any question about this one? So this wasn't part of the question, uh, but roughly speaking, if we were to plot this, we were to plot each of these. So the perpendicular line, if I plot it in red, what's one of the points that's on the perpendicular line? 3, 9. Three, nine. Okay, and what uh, another uh, point that's on the perpendicular line? No, no, it's not. Three, nine, zero, zero, three. zero, three. Yeah, good. So at height zero, we have x is three. So something like this. Uh, this is the point I was trying to make. So like this one. Okay, and how does it slope from there? No, zero. When x is zero, when x is zero, y is three. Thank you brain was not cooperating. Okay, so then not, not this one. So from this point, how does it slope? Two. Two. So do I need to draw up and to the right or down and to the right? Uh -huh. Up and to the right. And I need, it, needs to meet, it needs to be more than one for one. It needs to be two for one. So it's sloped up like this. Okay, then how about if we were to sketch the, the parallel line, this one. So when x is 0, what is y? 21 over, two. 21 over 2, which as a decimal is what? 10 and a half or so. So it come, it's got some point up here, and then how does it slope? Down, Down and to the right and it needs to meet this one at a right angle. So it should look something like this. <clears throat> so they meet at a right angle. Good. Any question about this one? <clears throat> OK, so let's do a couple of those word problem ones. And then we'll move on to a new topic. So I'm going to read a story out loud, and then we'll write down the salient bits. The perimeter of a rectangular outdoor patio is 54 feet. OK, so there's a rectangle involved somehow. What is perimeter? The outer edge? So like, is it the same as length? What it, oh, going all the way around, OK. So circles, they have a perimeter. That's, that's, that's uh, if you were drawing it, that's how much ink it would take. Okay. Rectangle is the same. You trace the four sides. Triangle is the same. You trace the three sides. So shapes have a perimeter. Okay. Uh, so a rectangular outdoor patio perimeter has, is 54 feet. The length is three feet greater than the width. What are the dimensions of the patio? Okay. So rect rectangle, rectangle perimeter is 54 feet. Uh, the length is 3 feet greater than the width.
and the instruction is find the dimensions. Okay, so to get full credit on such a question, you need to do two things. You need to draw a picture, and then for every named quantity in the story, you need to come up with a symbolic quantity name for it. So that is to say, so we're talking about a rectangle, so let's draw a rectangle. So this is the alleged patio. So, so one of the named quantities is perimeter. Okay. So what variable name, what symbol do you want to represent perimeter? Okay, how about P? P is good. Okay, what's another one? Another named quantity? Length. Length. Okay, and what do you want to use for length? L, L okay. Uh, what's another named quantity? Width. Width. And what name do you want to use for it? J. J. <laughs> In principle, you could use any, you could use anything, but I'm I'm gonna go ahead and use W. Okay. Well, you can use anything except P or L, because they're already taken. Okay. So now let's let's um, we need to say how these symbols relate to the picture. So how do they relate? So what, for example, what does L have to do with the picture? The longer side. Why is it the longer side? It's three plus the width. Okay. Three feet plus three feet greater than the width. Right. So this says that the length is three feet greater than the width. So the length, the length is the longer side. Okay. So here's an L. Is that the only L? No, there's the L on the northern tree. Okay. Good. So there's an L up here. Okay, what else? The width is the other ones, right? Okay, now, now even before we get to the actual numbers, even before we get to the actual numbers, you know something about perimeter even before this question. How, how are these, these symbols all related to each other algebraically? Yes, the sum, the sum of the of these uh, extents must be the perimeter. So, what's the formula for perimeter? Two length plus two. Width. Right, plus two w. So that was knowledge before before the story began. Okay. So now the story adds more information. So from the story, we know something else. Uh, so this sentence, what does that sentence add? Well, specifically, to, to be just one step behind you, how about P is known to be 54? Okay. So P is known to be 54. Uh, the second sentence. What does the second sentence tell you? Yes. Okay. And then the third sentence is making a specific request of you. What specific request is being made of you? So find what? Find L and W. And okay, just to remind you, so that you understand my style, in case you weren't here the first or weren't listening the first time I said it. So when I'm writing prose, that is to say English language stuff, I write in caps. And then when I'm writing math stuff, I write in 
cursive, so I'm not like losing my mind, you know, and sometimes doing it one way and sometimes the other. It's a stylistic convention. Okay, so now, gathering this all together, we want to find L and W. So as a consequence of all of this, we know two things. We, we can start here. P is known to be 54 from the story, and even without the story, P is known to be 2W plus 2L. So what can we conclude from this? Okay, and so if P is this thing and P is the other thing, then these two must be equal. By the way, what's that called? It's a, it's a vocabulary word that the state of Texas alleges you know. It, so the, the formal statement is something like, if A is B and B is C, then A is C. So what's that called? It, it's a kind of deduction. It starts with T and ends with that one, the transitive property. She beat me, right? I couldn't make the joke. So good job. <laughs> good job, right? <laughs> no one wants to hear that joke. <laughs> okay, so then by the transitive property, yes. So 54 is 2W plus 2L. Okay, now what? Right. So we can take this piece of information and plug it in there, right? L is known to be 3 plus W. So 2W plus 2 times 3 plus W. And now we can simplify and collect and everything. So 54 is 2w plus 2 uh, times 3 is, I'll just go ahead and do that. That's not a big deal. Where did my eraser go? Six plus 2w. So 54 is 4w plus 6. Okay, now what? Subtract 6. So subtracting the same thing from both sides is always truth preserving, so I'm not worried about that. So now what are we going to do? Oh, dividing. Oh, I'm worried about that because that's not always truth preserving. Is it, always, is it truth preserving to divide by 4? Yes. Yes. When, what is not truth preserving? Dividing by 0. Dividing by zero. So 4 is not 0, so this is, this is safe. So have we answered the question? No. Why not? So you haven't talked about, you haven't, well, you it's not finished. Not. Right. So the instruction was find L and W. So as a result, we've established that W is 12, and then what's L? 15. Any question about that? <clears throat> now, I have a couple of comments to forestall your questions. And that is, do you have to show this much work? More or less, yes, if you would like full credit. What this question and questions like this are testing, we want to see that you can draw something, take a story, from the story, make some symbol symbolic variables, relate them to a drawing, and then perform some algebraic manipulations with respect to those symbols. Now here's a different way to solve the problem, which if you were in the real world, okay, if you were making a patio or whatever, you could do it like this. You could say, okay, well, I'm going to try W is 8, and then uh, if W is 8, then L is 11, but that's not the right perimeter. So I'll try W is 9. Oh, that's not right either. Okay, I'll try W is 10. Oh, no, that's not right either. And then you just keep doing it until finally you happen upon W is 12, and then, oh, I got it. That's fine, that works in the real life, but that is literally what's not what is being graded on this exercise. Okay, 
So if you do that on an exercise like this, you'll receive zero credit because it is, it is really and almost utterly irrelevant for you to get to W is 12 and L is 15. What's being trained and what's being tested is you reading a story, drawing a picture, relating the, the things in the story to mathematical symbols and then algebraic, algebraically manipulating them. Not a bunch of button mashing on your calculator. Okay? So any question about, about this? Okay. <clears throat> and that's just to forestall. Sometimes I wonder why I say that kind of thing in class. Because, because what will happen is there's someone who's probably not in class currently who's going to do the button mashing thing and get 12 and 15. And they're going to get a zero. And then they're going to say, but I got 12 and 15. And I'm going to have to explain to them one more time because <laughs> they, weren't, they weren't here for the explanation in the first place. So let's do another one. OK, so I'm going to read the story out loud. And then we'll write down the salient details. Find the dimensions of a shipping box. Given that the length is twice the width, the height is 8 inches, and the volume is 1,600 cubic inches. So we've got a box, somehow, which is, more, which is more or less just like a rectangle. So this problem is, in that way, quite similar to uh, the previous one. So find the dimensions of a shipping box. Okay, the length is twice the width. Is twice the width. The height is eight inches. And the volume is 1,600 uh, cubic inches. And the instruction is find the dimensions. OK, so what's the first task? OK, to find the terms. So. What's the first term we need to give a symbol for? OK, so it's a, so it's a box. So what's the, what's the name for? Uh, I guess we don't, maybe, maybe don't know the name. So box looks like this. I'll draw a picture. So by the way, what's the math vocabulary word for box? Well, it's not a cube unless, unless all the dimensions are the same, right? Rectangular prism. OK, good. So then it's a box, so I drew a picture. Uh, so what's the, what's the first symbol that needs a name, the, the first quantity that needs a name? Length. Okay. And what, do you, what name do you want to use? OK, L. What's the next one? Width. And what do you want to use? W. OK. What's the next one? Height. What do you want to use? H. OK. And then what's the next one? Volume. Volume. What do you want to use? OK, V. <clears throat> OK. So some of these things, some, some things we knew before the problem started. So what, what, 
relates all of these things even before the problem started. Yes, volume is known to be the product of these things. Okay, that, that is not part of the story. So from the story, we have additional information. What does the first sentence tell us? Very good. The second sentence tells us something. What does the second sentence tell us? H is equal to 8. H is 8. And then what does the third sentence tell us? Very good. V is 1600. Okay, and then the last sentence is, is, is our actual instruction. So what is the instruction? Yes, find L, W, and H. So is there any question about the setup before we do any, any algebra? Okay, so now what? We've got to start plugging things in. So we know that on the one hand, V is 1600, and on the other hand, V is the product of L, W, and H. Okay, so 1600 must be LWH. So I'm, I'm just going to do one step at a time. So now what can we do? Plug in H. Okay, so 1600 is LW times 8. Okay, divide by 8. That would be 200 is LW. Okay, now what? Okay. So 200 is 2WW. Two now what? Okay. <laughs> 200 is 2W squared. Divide by 2. Good. Uh, w squared. Square root of both sides? Okay. So the square root of 100 is the square root of w squared. Okay, so what's the square root of 100? 10. 10. And what's the square root of w squared? W. No. W. No. What's the square root of w squared? Uh, absolute, value of w. absolute value of w. Every time, the square root of blah squared is blah. So as a result of this, there's two possibilities. It must be the case that w is negative 10 or w is 10, but what? But this is a, this is a, a physical object, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Therefore, the only possibility is that W is 10, because this is a physical object. I mean, can you imagine what it would mean to have a box that had a negative dimension? Like if this pen, if this pencil was, was negative 6 inches long, and I took another one that was positive 6 inches long, and I put them together, they'd disappear. That'd be, they'd be, they'd be, they would cancel each other out. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be... Something to see. Okay. Uh, I lost track of my thought. So have we answered the question? No? Okay, why not? What? We haven't found L. So W is 10. Okay, then what is L? L is 20. Uh-oh, and how do we figure out what H is? Okay, good. Any question about this one? It's the process. The process is what's being graded. 
It's it's not the arrival at the at at twenty at, at ten twenty eight. It's it's not arriving there which is being graded. It's the process by which you get there which is being graded. Good. Any questions about this? Okay. So now let's move to the next thing. So any questions before we move to something very different? Okay, so now we're in section what? 2-4. That was 2-3 that we just did. So we're in section 2.4, which is called complex numbers. <coughs> Now, finally, on the first day, on the first day of class, after the syllabus anyway, we went over some sets of numbers. We talked about, we talked about uh, the naturals, the integers, the rationals, and then we talked about the reals. And I, I said at that time that even the name reals is a, is a joke, and I laugh inside just a little bit every time I say it. Okay, and now I can finally explain to you why I have a little laugh every time I say the real numbers. <laughs> and hopefully you'll laugh too. Okay, so start out like this. <clears throat> so here's something that we haven't really done a lot of, but we're, I'm going to introduce it here. So x squared minus, minus uh, say, 11x and then plus 24 is equal to 0. So here's an equation that we want to solve. So I want you to solve this. And this will be the first time we've done this in this class anyway. So the general strategy here is to do what? Factor the left-hand side. So the left-hand side is a, is a degree 2 polynomial, but because degree 2 polynomials are so common and important. They have a, their own special name. So what's the name of a degree 2 polynomial? Starts with Q. Quadratic. Quadratic. Okay. And in particular, this polynomial on the left-hand side has a leading coefficient of 1, so we even have a special name for that. It's a monic. It's monic. So it's a monic quadratic, one of our favorite things. So it's quite easy to factor a monic quadratic. How does this factor? Very good. So x minus 3 multiplied by x minus 8 is equal to 0. And so now we have the product of things is equal to 0. And one of the properties of the reals is that if you have a product that is equal to 0, at least one of those things must be 0. So either this one is 0 or that one is 0. That is the only way that could possibly be the case. Because if, if both of them were non-zero, their product could not be zero. So a consequence of this is that either x minus 3 is zero or x minus 8 is zero. And this first equation is pretty easy to solve. <laughs> so so how, do you, how do you solve that one? OK, good. So x is 3 or, and what's the last one? x is 8. So if you take these, these numbers, 3 and 8, you can see that here, well, if you were to plug in 3 into, into that one, you plug 3 into that one, what do you get? Negative 5. But, it, but in a sense, that's irrelevant because if you were to plug 3 into that one, you get 0 for that one. Okay, and vice versa for the 8. So if you plug 8 into that one, you get 0. And it doesn't matter what the other one is, because it's going to be multiplied by 0. Okay. Any question about this one? So let's do a slight variation on this theme. So x squared minus 1 equal to 0. <clears throat> so again, I want to solve this by factoring. So how does x squared minus 1 factor? Good. And 
at zero. So I think it's probably not too far for me to just skip to the end and say, well, x has to be negative 1 or x has to be 1. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at this equation in a slightly different way and move that one to the other side and say, well, this other equation is equivalent to that one. x squared is 1. And so the question, in a sense, is, is, is there anything that you can square so that you'll get 1? One, with one squares to one. Negative one also squares to one. Okay, good. So any question about this one? Okay, now here's, the, here's, the, here's the, the rub. So this was the setup. Okay, and here we come to the, to the motivation. So here's a, an equation. So how about this one? Does it factor? Well, isn't it the difference of squares? No, it's the sum of squares, right? It's not x squared minus 1 squared. It's x squared plus 1 squared. So it's the sum of squares. Can you think of two numbers, two numbers whose product is 1 and whose sum is 0? Alternatively, let's look at this equation in, the, in a different way and say what's being asked for is if I move that 1 to the other side, what I want, what I'm asking for is I want an x squared, I want an x that squares to negative 1. So, so how about it? An x which would square to negative 1. Well, what if x was positive? If x was positive, then you would square it, and what would you have? Positive. Something that's positive. So this couldn't possibly, it couldn't possibly be a positive x. Okay. Maybe, maybe a negative x would do. Why not? Right, because the product of two negative things is positive. So if you square a negative, the result would again be positive. Is that all of the possible x's? Mm -hmm. No, there's one more. 0, right, which is neither, yeah. neither positive nor negative. How about what's the square of 0? It's 0, and in particular, it's not negative 1. So do, do we agree that there's not a real x that squares? There's not an x that's in the reals that squares to negative 1. OK. So at some point in history, that was just, you know, most, pe most people just said, Okay, yeah, there's, there isn't a, there isn't a, and it, they weren't called real numbers, they're just called numbers. There isn't a number that squares to negative one, and most people just said, okay, fine. But some people, a group of people said, they said, no, I insist. <laughs> no, I really would like to know what it would mean what it would mean for this equation to have a solution. And so at that point, someone just said, OK, I'm going to make the following definition. I'm going to define, so let i be a quantity, quantity, such that I solves this equation, which is to say, so can you see that line? It's kind of blown out on my screen. That is to say that I squared is negative 1. OK? So this i is, i, is i real? Now, it couldn't be real because we just, we just discussed that it couldn't be a positive real, it couldn't be a negative real, it couldn't be 0. So i is not real. And so in history, in history, uh, you should understand that in, in our time, you know, we have different names for different people who do 
technical things. Like we have biologists who study technical things about life forms. We have chemists who study technical things about molecules. And you've got mathematicians and physicists. We've got all these groups, and they're all named. But at this time, at the time when this was being discussed, pe people had not been differentiated into these groups. There were no chemists and biologists and mathematicians and things like this. Everyone was just called a, a natural philosopher. So, for example, one of the most famous mathematicians, physicists of all time, is Isaac Newton except he was never called a physicist or a mathematician in his day. He was called a natural philosopher. So the, the people who would, <laughs> the people who, who said, no, I insist, I just really want to know what this would be about, okay, they're, they're kind of like the people who would be mathematicians one day, okay? And then the majority of people who saw this said, that is the most ridiculous thing I have ever heard. And, and at that point, this became called the imaginary number, okay? Which is why it's denoted with I for imaginary. So I is called the imaginary unit. The imaginary unit, okay? So, okay, fine. Now we have another definition. The set of complex numbers is the numbers is the set of all expressions a plus b i where a and b are each real. So A, this is called the real part. And B, this is called the imaginary part. The B is called the imaginary part. Not, in particular, not BI, the B. So, so um, the word complex in English has at least two distinct meanings. One of them means complicated and difficult. Another one means consisting of multiple parts. Consisting of multiple parts is what, is what it's meant here. So for example, a shopping complex is not, a, is not an area in which it is particularly difficult to shop, <laughs> right? It is an area in which there are multiple places to shop, a shopping complex. Okay, so last thing, last thing, is that complex numbers have arithmetic associated to them. So we need to do one quick example. So two plus three i, and then we're going to multiply by 5 minus 4i. So these work, at least at first, just like the product of binomials. So what is the name for the formula for the product of binomials? FOIL. So we're going to do, I'm going to FOIL this real quick. So that would be 10 minus 12, uh, oops, uh, minus 8i. So 10 minus 8i plus 15i, uh, and then minus 12i squared. And then I'll collect and say that that's 10 uh, plus 7i minus 12i squared. And so far, there's no distinction between, between this and, uh, and if, x, if i was an x. But now here's where things get weird. What gets weird? I squared. I squared is negative one. I squared is negative one. Yeah, so this is 10 plus 7i, and then minus 12 minus 1. 
because it's this is outside, inside, and then the sum of those is 7. Okay, and so that's plus 12. So then the answer is 22 plus 7i. So the product of two complex numbers is yet another complex number. That's interesting. So the punchline to the story is, that you can think about over the weekend, is that, okay, the would-be physicists, as a joke, said, ah, that's just imaginary. And then the mathematicians, as their own counter joke, said, okay, well, we're gonna, name, we're gonna rename the numbers the real numbers. And so to call the numbers the real numbers is a joke. And mathematicians get the last laugh because modern, modern physics, especially quantum mechanics, what number system do you think it is posed in? The complex numbers. <laughs> That's what you get. <laughs> Have a nice weekend.